Welcome to another episode of Shortcast Over Coffee. Our guest today is Dr. Nandita Ayer. Nandita is an author and a food blogger who truly embodies the Hippocrates philosophy of let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. A qualified doctor and a nutritionist, Nandita has authored four books, the links to which I have put in the show notes. She is also a social media influencer and busts some popular misconceptions about food. Her blog, Saffron Trail at saffrontrail.com, is a fantastic repository of healthy vegetarian recipes. Nandita on Instagram has recently started to post reels under the name The Agarbatti Series, and I would highly recommend you guys check it out for their sarcasm and sense of humor. She's also a wonderful singer trained in both Carnatic and Hindustani classical music. This is part 1 of a two-part episode. In this episode we take a deep dive into Nandita's upbringing in a middle-class Tamil household in Mumbai and her nostalgia associated with food. So without further ado, let's get into the conversation. Hi Nandita, thank you so much for agreeing to be on my podcast. Um I know you have been an active blogger since the mid 2000s. but i came to know of you fairly recently through youtube and instagram and the book the everyday healthy vegetarian i understand that you were born and raised in mumbai but are currently based in bangalore do you get to visit mumbai often and what about mumbai has changed from when you were growing up hi bala thanks for having me on the podcast so yeah straight jumping into mumbai from bangalore um uh, yeah i was born and brought up in mumbai and uh, i think i'm so i was born and brought up in mumbai and i am a fourth generation mumbai kar so uh, even though i'm tamil my uh, i wasn't uh, in tamil nadu at all uh, for all my life and um, what yeah i do i used to go often uh, my husband used to work in mumbai for like most of the week so sometimes we used to go there instead of him coming to bangalore we would go there to uh, mumbai again that was like a completely different part of mumbai where i have not lived before so you know i think there are different mumbais in mumbai every different place you go it feels like a different city like south bombay is like you know more european style uh, bigger roads and you know the buildings and stuff and you know many other parts of bombay are like a constant work in progress with construction so you don't feel like it's one city it's got just so many uh, aspects to it and uh, even whenever i visit i having lived there all my life even when i visit i feel like i am discovering something new or uh, and the fact that you asked about changes there's so many new things happening constantly that i don't even recognize what these places are if i if i went last year and if i go now there will be some new flyover somewhere some new road and some newer buildings and i i would have lost all my old landmarks so i think it's a city in constant churn and change and it's not something that you know you can identify with from what i've grown up at all it's totally different now yeah you mentioned that you are fourth generation mumbaiker uh so your great grandfather migrated to mumbai so this should be in the mid 1930s around that time i think 30s or 40s i kind of forget right now i had a note somewhere but i uh, couldn't uh, you know get the exact year but possibly uh, 30s 40s would be right and i think in those days it was like someone from your village went to bombay for you know after your education then what like if you didn't want to be into farming or teaching or a priest these were the very few options available uh, back in the village so if somebody you knew went off to uh, bombay or any other big city for that matter then uh, you know they would just uh, write to them and saying hey come here there are opportunities i think that's how it worked and uh, my grandfather my great grandfather had done an mma in english and he just decided that okay some railways job is opening up and he landed up <laughs> i'm sure he must have stayed in some relatives house or i think by then he was already married and then of course once 
settled then you know either they go back and uh, get their family and things like that but as far as i know even my grandmother was born in uh, bombay so uh, i think uh, that's how it all got started and one one family member brings the other and i've heard stories about how uh, it's not a story because i myself have lived in that house with them during my holidays and stuff so it's like a a one living room and a kitchen that's the extent of the house and having a bathroom and all that in your own house was considered a big luxury in those days so you had to pay extra for that so uh, in house bathroom now we talk about in room bathrooms but those days in house having a bathroom was a luxury uh so just in that much of space anybody who came from outside like some second cousin third cousin in search of a job and before they got settled they would always live in the houses and people always did that because when they came first to the city they also lived in someone's house like that yeah and it's it's that- fascinating how similar the stories are i mean even some of my dad's brothers i know it's a completely different generation but what used to happen was you know some some were good in studies so they would go go on to do college and what not but then a lot of them would not cross 10th so my grandfather would just write a letter to this one distant cousin in mumbai be like hey this person this happened to one of my sons and would you be willing to take him under his wings and they would just they would just go and uh, like you said stay with one of their distant relatives his families and learn maybe shorthand and stenography and 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 then find a job and then make their way up so it's fascinating how similar the stories are yeah and in those days exactly not everybody was even getting like a graduation or a post graduation uh, degree even in the privileged uh, people they would just study for whatever until they got a job somewhere because earning was also important uh, unless you were so rich that you could just continue studying that was not an option and they got married early then you have to support your family so all that you know is like a chain and it just uh, i remember you know some of these stories i mean i've been fortunate to have spent a lot of time with them in fact my great grandmother passed away only in 2009 in her 90s so my son was she was fortunate to see her great great grandchild my son so we have like a five generation um, picture together uh, i kept wow. telling my son if you were a daughter then we would be five women in row but you are a son so uh, it's like four women and one boy at the end so yeah did you have a lot of conversation with your grandparents and ask them about how life was back in those days like you know it's such an alien land right mumbai you know coming from tamil nadu with not i'm i'm pretty sure the tamil community back in those days was not as big as now do you have any stories that that you heard from your grandmother yeah i mean i have of course plenty of stories with my grandparents because i was brought up by my grandparents but because uh, we also lived all close to each other so i was fairly regular hanging out with my great grandparents as well uh and my parents lived with my great grandparents so like i was living with my grandparents and my mom was living with her grandparents so when i went to visit my parents i would inadvertently be with my great grandparents as well <laughs> i don't know if that sounds too confusing but uh, that's how i got otherwise it's rare that you get to spend time with your great grandparents so much so i have spent a lot of uh, holidays and my mom uh was a working woman for most of her life so when i went to stay with them i just had to spend the whole day with my great grandparents and time would go very very slowly there was nothing much even in mumbai and, yeah even in mumbai It's probably the fastest so, city in india <laughs> i didn't have cousins and all in, you know i was the oldest kid and uh, my next my cousin was born like after 8 years after me so there was nobody really to play with and you know in those days the dynamics were very different even if you if you go to some other new place the kids there are not going to immediately start playing with you and all and even i was a shy kid so i would not just go approach people and say hey i'm going to play with you so i would just sit in the balcony and watch all of them play and uh, you know lot of my favorite pastime was lot of vendors would keep coming and going there so we had like this first floor 
house with a balcony and in between there was this huge space so all the vendors so my favorite pastime was to imitate their calls back <laughs> <laughs> that's how i would be killing my summer holidays uh, you know learning all their different window calls like imli and fish and whatever used to come to that area and, um, and even salt i remember that very distinctly vendors used I, to come sell salt yeah yeah salt so oh. uh, this was in the early 80s early to mid 80s you can say so um, all these things now and also because mumbai is surrounded by a lot i mean apart from being a big city it's surrounded by so many small villages like you know there was this all these banana products like small banana and uh, the banana flower banana stem there used to be one banana wala from vasai they typically come with this basket with a stick and hanging two baskets on the side and it would be full of those things so there were different vendors for everything and you know like how we just feel like that that door delivery system was very strong even in those days and i remember uh, going uh, to the vegetable market now this uh, matunga had a very good vegetable market even in those days uh, lots of vegetable vendors and all that and i would uh, like you know as a kid what do you do whenever great grandfather goes out for a walk or my great grandmother went out to the market i just accompanied her walk with her. that was like the entertainment thing to do so um, we would go buy vegetables and all so my uncle who's uh, my mom's cousin brother he had this running joke with my great grandmother that after so many years of living in mumbai you taught you guys have taught all the up and bihar veggie vendors tamil words for all the veggies but you guys didn't learn like any proper hindi of course she knew hindi but it was not like she could be she wasn't ever speaking fluently in hindi but the funny thing is all the vegetable vendors and all the vendors in matunga new tamil you know just they knew that if we need these guys business we need to learn the language and uh, that was that's something that stuck in my head like how that whole area was in those days uh, you know the temples the flowers the hotels the you know chota shops and everything was like such a ecosystem of its own very south indian culture uh, with a few gujaratis and then slowly the population of gujaratis went up and a lot almost all the tamilians sold and went off further away further away uh, in the city to you know kind of make the record on the real estate boom etc so uh, i uh, i got to spend a lot of time with my great grandparents i think more than anything else i just remember a very slow life <laughs> and uh, you know learning to live with what felt like a very boring day and trying to figure out something to do on my own uh, keeping yourself occupied because there was nobody to even say that i'm bored and i want to do something in what way they can't entertain me in any way so i think just learning to be self sufficient and also of- even even in that even in those days i don't think bombay had bombay homes had any backyard it was all like societies right so you couldn't even go to the backyard yeah. and play those games yeah, or yeah. yeah i always wondered why you know people from the people from the south when they migrated to mumbai chose to be in matunga and chembur i think uh, definitely because the ecosystem was already there and uh, like i said when you first entered the city you lived with some relative or a known person from the village and then it's obvious that you will also look for a house in the same area one is you have that emotional support of when you're going to a completely new city which is like hundreds of kilometers away you want some grounding and you want some connection with your roots and you feel a bit of security in knowing that hey you know we have some known people here and uh, i think that was the reason they just looked for houses in the same vicinity and then slowly they started uh, growing in that and then you know the required vegetables were available the uh, required temples were there and all these things put together Uh, they just felt like yeah i don't feel so far away from home and i think that's what led to people living in that because those days the re- the rents or the real estate was still not so unaffordable that that made you 
decide that was your primary deciding factor in where to live it was more cultural i felt i feel yeah yeah that's true and i think i i remember i mean some of my family is in matunga and i i just love going to ramashray and yeah. it's such a such a sweet memory yeah so there is this place called concerns i don't know if it's still there uh so now uh, i mean the last i knew they were serving food and stuff but uh, my great grandfather whenever you know i think when he first came to matunga he lived there as a boarder so boarding and lodging was taken care of for like a small sum and before he could find a house etc because how long can you pile on in relatives houses so only when my great grandmother moved in did he actually find a place on rent um, so a lot of places and we've been there for ages so i also love going there whenever i'm in bombay at least i make one trip around the place and uh, but finally my upbringing my first 10 years was all in south bombay because i lived with my grandfather and he had his uh, quarters there so uh, i grew up in south bombay without even knowing that is south bombay because ultimately you're still in this very middle class tamilian house you're not in any fancy i mean although we had the most like fanciest posh sea facing huge apartment on the ninth floor on napian sea road which is like the hottest location <laughs> like uh, you know uh, in bombay but i lived there without even knowing where i am because i was quite young and i was just uh, until i was 10 and after that is when i moved to the vadala matunga area which is like more south indian and that's when i felt the culture shock like where am i this seems like another city all together <laughs> so uh, so yeah growing up in fact i was uh, every door every balcony i opened we had the view of the arabian sea and i used to feel like what is this boring view wherever i see i can only see the sea <laughs> talk about irony <laughs> and now people are dying to have like even if you have like a speck of the sea somewhere in the horizon people call that as a sea view and those apartments are sold for a premium yeah that's crazy i think mumbai right now is probably the the most expensive city to buy real estate absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. growing up in the 1980s i've i've always wanted to ask this to someone uh, especially someone who was raised in mumbai is someone old <laughs> <laughs> not really but 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 you might have noticed how india has changed from the 1990s right after the liberalization and and all of that but like growing up in the 80s what are your like best food memories uh snacks and things that that were existent back in those days that that probably just died you know i'm thinking about how uh, when you grow up in a simple middle class uh, when you have a simple middle class upbringing you're not traveling uh, too much for uh, you know leisure you are like maybe going to a temple or someone's wedding or something it's very uh, you know it's very goal oriented travel uh, you're not eating out too much you're not watching too many movies uh, and i feel that's when uh, home food makes an anchor for some very beautiful memories or even a small treat you had somewhere you remember that occasion that you know something happened that day and we went out and we had this food and i think that is impossible to have today because we are just having such an overwhelming amount of uh, things to do and eating out and entertaining and enjoying that that that's become we have normalized that like i think if we have a slow day where we are not doing anything that becomes a memorable day for us today so i remember you know when it comes to food memories i my earliest food memories and when i was 7 i got bitten by my friend's dog and uh, you know those days we had to have at least 13 injections and it was in the stomach and uh, just the memory of that is very traumatic for me because those days the injection needles were very large bore and injections were bloody painful it's not like it's today that you just take an injection and you come back home it was a traumatic event in your life but and my aunt took me and we had to go all the way to nayar hospital which is like a government hospital which is where the only place where you used to get these anti rabies shots and all that so it was not available everywhere so my aunt used to take me there after work every evening or something i don't remember the frequency of the shots but in all it was 13 shots and uh, what i remember is of course 
that trauma of having to go through that. But then at the end of my entire course, she took me to one nice ice cream place and she bought me an ice cream. So now I feel like it was a very sweet ending to that very dreadful experience. And, you know, since then I've eaten thousands of ice creams in my life. But that one ice cream memory was so precious because it felt like a full stop to that, you know, course of injections and that very painful experience. And, uh, you know, so that was one thing. And and the other thing, like observing what your elders eat around the house, right? Like as a kid, uh, you're subconsciously just observing a lot and absorbing a lot. You're just looking at what people are doing. So when I used to spend some holidays with my great-grandparents, my great-grandfather was retired by then. And of course, he was like a thorough foodie. Uh, he even knew to cook very well, apparently. I have not uh, had his food, but like when my great-grandmother was traveling, he used to fry puris in ghee and, you know, make for his daughters and all for school and all that he's done. So uh, fried puris in ghee and potato and all. I'm sure like he had the complete indulgent mindset when there was nobody to monitor him. And I remember that he used to uh, go into the, because there were only two rooms in the house, you could well sit in one place and know everything was going on in the house. So he would go to the kitchen and um, there were these uh, shelves on the top. Uh, there were no like cupboards and cabinets in those days. It was just like an open shelves. And I knew that some dabbas were kept there. And he would take a handful of raw peanuts and a handful of jaggery. And that was his like afternoon snack. So, of course, I would be looking at him and he would give some to me. And while it was not very exciting, I thought, yeah, this is interesting, you know, because in those days, the jaggery used to be a bit salty also because of some impurities and whatever, like, I don't know. But that salty, sweet jaggery and the peanuts, even though they were not even roasted peanuts, they were just raw peanuts. This is like, what do you say? It's like an emergency snack. There's nothing at home. What do I eat? So he used to, and without waking up his wife or bothering anybody, he would get this for himself. So that's another memory. And like, sometimes I try to reach out for a little bit of that, like a post uh, meal dessert kind of thing. And it brings back that, you know, memory of my great grandfather doing that. Yeah, and, it's, it's, uh, it's actually yeah. funny that, that you say this. I mean, typical middle class people uh you know you would only eat out if you went to a temple and if your mom cannot cook yeah. that that used to be the case pretty much and uh the other few food memories that are very strong in my mind is uh you know i think all of us love bakshanam or all those muruk and all those goodies right who doesn't i don't know i'm yet to find someone who doesn't like it so for uh, uh, Gokulashtami or uh, Krishna Janmashtami, at home, my grandmother used to prepare like six, seven, eight different things. And I would be very annoyed with her. I would say, why on earth are you making everything on the same day? Like you could spread this out and I could get stuff like for a longer time and you're making everything at once. You think this is not for you. This is for... <laughs> I'm not making this for you. It's for the... Uh, prasadam or the nevedium whatever and uh, so we we do it because this is the custom we have to make all of lord krishna's favorites on this day and the more annoying thing was that you were not allowed to touch anything until it was that you know the janmashtami was over and everything was and like i knew it and like i was a good kid i knew exactly where those dabbas were and if i had whacked some few seed eye and some muruk nobody would have known but i never did that and it would be so like uh, it was a test of patience and your self control not to not to raid those things before this thing was done and uh, and you know that an evening getting to eat all these things because again there was a set time for everything it was not like you know morning you can't eat like cream biscuits and fried food and stuff and why are you eating this first thing in the morning and I catch myself saying that to my son sometimes, although I I'm, I try not to be controlling as much. But that just comes because you're brought up with that day in and day out. Uh, and then having getting to eat all this for like dinner, a plate full of snacks. <laughs> it was like such a, such a, a different from normal day, right? So you end up remembering that and you end up looking forward to that festival just for this uh, uh, this thing. 
and in exact contrast to this during diwali i have like amazing food memories because a uh, few days before my grandmother and all my aunts they would bring the gas and put it on the floor and buy all the ingredients fresh i'm almost tempted to say ordered but there was no ordering in those days it you had to go to the shop and buy because this is our normal is ordering stuff uh buying all the fresh ingredients and sitting around the gas stove and everybody chatting and everything and you know that mixture that they used to make would have like some eight ten different ingredients to put together that's why mixture right like the chivda diwali special mixture and just the aromas from the kitchen and just seeing all those things and things piled up on newspapers and then mixed and put into big you know dabbas uh and i think just that aroma of that asafoetida and that oil and things being fried i think it's very very uh, evocative and my mom even today she's in her 70s but sometimes she just ends up making a small batch of this thing by herself even today just because my niece and nephew are uh, like 6 7 years old and because they like these things she just makes it for them and i feel like where do you get this energy because this is like a five six person thing to do and i remember how it would was done and the silver lining of all of this was that there was no such restriction we could eat this immediately and it was not like it had to be saved for diwali day to be eaten and of course i they would always say you know keep something or at least to last until diwali don't finish everything but you were allowed to eat it and taste it because there was no like uh, you know nevedya or that kind of offering to god for diwali so all this was ours to you know put our hands on as soon as it was ready and no matter what you buy like these you know as much as i'm not uh, into glorifying any labor based stuff in the kitchen or the home but there is something to say about things just being fried fresh in a good quality oil with the freshly carefully bought ingredients and mixed and seasoned properly and just given it given to you as soon as it's ready that flavor is something else as compared to something we don't know god knows when it was packaged and it's been sitting in the store shelf for ages right so i think that diwali mixture memory is something else and also uh, recently uh, like you know we have a lot of these apps and all these days in bangalore food apps even like small home chefs and also some one gentleman had posted saying my mom she's from tirunel valley or tanjavur or somewhere i don't remember where and uh, she's making the traditional mixture at home and it's being sold for this i put first dibs on that and like a full dabba like how much my granny used to make and keep i ordered that and i got it and i eat it and i messaged you saying boss this was just like it's come very very close to what i had as a child and i think purely thanks to your mom and thanks to you for doing this letting us you know enjoy what she's made so like from you know that that's that if it when it just hits that flavor that you've enjoyed in your childhood and that's like a very sweet spot it hits it's very differently it's differently <laughs> yeah true. yeah i mean sometimes i just wonder you know you were talking about how people would just you know join their distant relatives or cousins moving into mumbai i have always wondered how did they manage to cook for so many people right i mean that's quite a miracle i mean you know families had 7 to 8 kids on an average mm-hmm. back in those days and i just wonder how did they manage to cook for all of them three times a day so i feel like uh, our basic tamil vegetarian cooking uh, of course it's way easier now because of pressure cooking and having some access to frozen vegetables and mixers and grinders and everything uh, and doing everything manually would not have been easy even for a very simple meal uh, but that said i think compared to north indian uh, food our south indian food is kind of easier to make for a larger quantity like you just cook extra rice extra sambar or dal or you know uh, you make idlis or yeah but certain things like dosa you know all one by one to make for everybody and also to grind that batter by hand you know 
and not to mention being stretched for money always like i've heard from my grandmother how sometimes for the milk the money had to be paid daily go to the counter get those glass bottles and come home so they would just look around the house like are there any you know one nanas two nanas fallen around the house somewhere in some corners to you know like in someone's pocket or something and uh, that's how they would make ends meet so i'm sure whoever stayed with them would pay them some money not for not because these were greedy people but because it was just the house with four kids and having a job and having to pay the rent in a big city uh, coming from a village would never be easy so it was the monetary aspect of things and you were just large hearted enough to accommodate them because you also did that with someone else it was like just paying it forward but i'm sure things were kept simple and nobody expected too much and uh, i'm sure if idlis were easier to make than those say then it would be idli for dinner or you know uh, somehow they would manage because uh, things of luxury like deep fried or uh, you know having those kind of things was not an everyday thing like i remember my grandmother making this uh, tiffin and every day mostly the tiffin would be either idli dosa or upma or something and tiffin was around 4 o'clock because the lunch time was around 10 30 11 so by 4 we would all be hungry uh, and very rarely she would make this dish and again she would it was an elaborate thing so i would know she's making something uh, laborious when she her first step would be to put the small gas stove on the floor and then sit down because uh, although she was not very old then but anything that's going to take time why keep standing on near the kitchen counter and straining yourself right so uh, so this, this there was this dish called pal boli okay and it was puris made using maida deep fried obviously until crisp or soft i don't remember that <laughs> but and then while this whole puri business was going on uh, a lot of milk with a lot of sugar was kept boiling on the side to reduce so not to the level of a milk made condensed milk but like halfway there and then these fried puris would be put into that milk and had and that was like your 4 o'clock general tiffin on a weekday afternoon but very rarely like once in 6 months kind of thing and it if i think about it today it's refined flour it's deep fried then it's put in almost like a highly sweetened condensed milk not an everyday superfood <laughs> and you are not having anything not an everyday superfood not good for you it ticks all the wrong boxes but that was happiness like sheer zero guilt joy and it was very occasion of course my family was like a, you know embodiment of moderation in everything so even a puri or even a you know fried papad would be no not like a everyday thing it was very once in a while even in those days even before anybody started telling them on instagram boss don't have fried food and all these things so as long as you're having balanced uh, home cooked food 80 to 90% of the time you should have that 10 to 15% leeway to just enjoy the foods you like uh because you know life is not just about counting calories and eating uh, clean eating and all those things it's you also need to enjoy life and a big part of enjoying life is food like i told you earlier you know middle class upbringing there is not so many other experiences to reminisce about or this but these food memories are so strong and they literally take me back to the day uh when some such meal was had and even though my memory of childhood and all i don't have too many and they are rather faded and poor but these uh, certain things i remember so well and it's only because it was associated with food yeah so you grew up in a very middle class bombay household and choose to do medicine that that was something that you always wanted to do or uh yeah good question uh see i think I- I was always good at science uh, at least in even in primary school and all and i have this uh and i remember very well how my science teacher would always write in my report card uh you know very well done my budding scientist 
I think that kind of went to my head. I thought, oh, maybe I can be a scientist. <laughs> I had no clue what a scientist does. <laughs> but I think that also goes to say how uh, when you are a young child, if someone encourages you and even encourages you beyond what you deserve, then you might end up having that confidence to believe that you can do that. Yeah, that even, is so true. Even while growing up, if if there is a te- there was a teacher that you did not like, or they they said something, it kind of it it stuck with you for a lifetime, right? Yeah. So I think that that put a seed in my head that maybe science is for me. And uh, although, funnily, my family always thought that uh, I should uh, become an IAS. I have no idea why. Uh, they thought I'll be good at that. In fact, I was uh, even named Indira after Indira Gandhi. And then very quickly, my dad changed my name to Nandita because that's the name he wanted to keep. And my grandfather had named me Indira. Maybe he was a fan of Indira Gandhi. I don't know. Was but... this before 1979, right? Yeah, I was 1977 born. So, uh, so uh, yeah, so I think my family wanted that from me. And... Uh, I thought they thought that would be good for me. They said you would have a good life and you will have a good post and you will be a good administrator and all that. And I had no clue what IAS people do also. Like I had no idea. So, but I did think I'm good at sciences and I was like always a first or second ranker in class. So I had any option was available to me. Like it was not, uh, I could go into science or I could go into the arts. I was reasonably good in language, English. And all that, uh, there were a lot of options. But what happens is that if when uh, in, your, in the 80s, 90s, early 90s, you literally went to the course where you did very well in your board exams. Like if you got an excellent PCB score. So yeah, um, so we yeah, have the physics, the PCB and the PCM score, right? So I scored reasonably okay in PCM, but I knew engineering is not something I wanted to do. And I scored quite well in the PCB and it, I was sure I would get a, a seat in a, you know, medical college in Bombay and without, you know, without that donation wala seat, like a merit seat. So it was a big deal. And uh, although I didn't know if I wanted to study medicine and, uh, you know, spend the next... I wasn't aware of all those things that is like 15, 17 years of pure unadulterated labor and hard work before you can even start earning money. Um, I didn't think about all that. And it was just like, you just have the seat, you got the marks and you just blindly jump into that course. And which is, I think most of the people of my generation, we did that, which is why you will find that People have done their engineering and done all kinds of MBA and then they have done some startup in food or some like people are just doing different things. And what they studied has no bearing on what they ultimately do for a living. And uh, so, yeah, that's how I joined medicine. And I didn't find it tough or anything. It was, of course, it was again like a culture shock, uh, you know, uh, suddenly the day one of medical college day one they, they call it orientation but there is no orientation day one you enter the anatomy lab with a room full of naked cadavers with a bunch of 50 boys and 50 girls like imagine just your first exposure to seeing a naked body is a naked dead body with a bunch of 99 other strangers in your batch and it's like a it's like an electric shock and of course that the smell of uh, formaldehyde, which is like makes your eyes water and like your brain melt literally. It's like so strong. And that's your first experience of medical college. And after that, you're numb to everything else because that's that's like you get a hard slap on your face the day you enter the college. I don't know if in uh, the present day situation, things have been tempered down a bit or people have some orientation and what you're going to do how there's some bit of mental preparation to this very stark thing that you are in school or you're in uh, such a protected environment until then and suddenly this is your first day in college you know so uh, 
it's a shocker but after that you just get adjusted to that and eventually after 3 4 months you realize people are actually eating lunch boxes sitting in that same room like you have no your senses are completely numbed out you are eating on that same table you have kept your lunch box and people are eating there even the teachers and all that so you just so used to hanging around cadavers after that you know so i feel um I think it just teaches you the first six months you just become a different person. Your vocabulary increases by another five thousand words that you've never heard before in your life. It's a whole new vocabulary, and um, you become a completely different person. Even I mean, especially if you've come from a very protected place. And I would say that uh, even being an out and out Mumbai girl, attending college in Mumbai, so I would still say it was not that much of a shocker to me. but i'm imagining a lot of other kids who came from other villages and uh, places in maharashtra uh, and coming to a city and having this experience i can only imagine how they dealt with it you know yeah so that's how i got into medicine and i i think i if i enter something i see it through so i didn't feel any difficulty in going through the course and you know the four and a half year course and then the one year internship it was tough but it was not like too tough and all this while you had never cooked <laughs> yes no cooking and uh, like i was brought up by my grandparents who had these extremely strict things about you know a, this has to go this way and then you, you should do this way and i had no patience for all that and and they said yeah just go read a book practice music do something why do you need to cook and that always our attitude was anyway later on when you are an adult and you are running your own house you'll have to do this every day so why do it now and i had three aunts for a long time they also lived with us until they got married so there was no dearth of women in the house who were you know willing to cook and they enjoyed cooking so i had no role to play in that so much later after all my aunts got married and i was living alone with my grandparents when i even started making tea and like sometimes i would make some instant noodles for myself or something like that so that was my first foray into cooking or i would just learn i knew how to uh, how to make dosa and all i would see my grandmother and i would try to replicate that for fun not really for cooking uh, but i also had i think i had the knack i could just see observe and i could get it right even though they would say oh you will take many years to learn how to make the right dosa but it just came to me easily so i think uh, anything handmade and doing things with my hands i was naturally drawn towards and i was quite creative in that uh, respect so i think despite not cooking i knew i could cook if i wanted to that was the end of part 1 of my conversation with nandita ayer stay tuned for part 2 where nandita takes us on a journey through her cooking and music experience till then peace <laughs>